chapter number 10. We'll grab a verse out of chapter number 11 as well. And I just want to stop and say it's good to be here tonight. It's, uh, it's just, it's good to be here. Uh, there were people here Sunday that I never dreamed would be here. And there were folks I was really looking for that, for whatever the reason, weren't here. I know one family was out of town. They were visiting with their family. And um, we're just going to gonna have to, I guess, walk by faith. Do you think that would be the best thing to do? Just trust God. But tonight, I'll read a verse of Scripture, then I'll give you, I'll give you my thought tonight, and then try to develop it as the Lord leads. In Hebrews chapter number 10, the Word of God said in verse number 35, I'm going to be backing up some in, in the study, but in verse 35 it said, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. How many of y'all have confidence tonight that God's still sitting right where he is sitting before all this mess started? And God's still doing the same thing he is doing before all this mess started. And uh, God said, don't cast away your confidence, which hath a great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience. Now, I don't know about you, buddy, but that right there speaks to my heart. That's, that's an area in my life where I have need of. I have need of patience. I, I'll tell this again. Brother Rick, I know you weren't here when I told it, but Houston Smith's one of our deacons. We were working around the church one day, and I got frustrated, Brother Rick. You ever get frustrated? Don't you lie to me. Your daddy's sitting right over there. Amen. I got a little bit frustrated, and I said, Brother Houston, pray for me. I said, patience is not my strong suit. And Houston said, I've noticed that about you. Just about like that, amen. Well, you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Underline that word promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. And will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I want to preach on this subject tonight. I'm preaching to God's people, the cream of the crop. I want to preach on this subject. It's bad, but it's fixing to get a whole lot better. It's bad, but it's fixing to get a whole lot better. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Hebrews. It's always been a special blessing to me. I pray, Father, tonight as we Open our Bibles that, God, you would open our hearts and open our minds and speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray you'd help me and to be an encouragement, God, to our people tonight. Lord, I realize tonight many will be watching our Father after a while when it's posted up on the website. And Lord, some even up in New York are watching our Father, and we understand that. May the message, our Father, be a blessing to your precious people. At the same time, our Father, peradventure, there's someone here tonight that don't know you. Or peradventure, Lord, someone tunes in later at a later time or a later date that doesn't know you. It's my prayer, God, that something be said that, Lord, would convict their heart that they might get ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Father, Thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for giving us a little corner, Lord, in your field to work in and labor in in these days. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. 
I believe with all of my heart that this book that I have in front of me teaches us that Jesus is coming. I believe with all of my heart that we'll never have revival until we get excited about the cardinal doctrines of the Word of God once again. I mean, we're living in a generation we can have Christmas without getting excited. We can have Easter without getting excited. A pastor can get up and preach on the cross and nobody get excited. Talk about the blood of Jesus and nobody gets excited. Talk about the coming of the Lord. Now listen, I'm not talking about the excitement that pumps up the flesh. I'm talking about, beloved, there ought to be something down deep in every one of God's children that says, even so come, Lord Jesus, knowing that it's a whole lot better yonder than it is down here, amen. I'm enjoying life. I enjoy my children, my grandchildren. I enjoy my church. But I'm gonna tell you something right now. You ain't seen nothing yet, honey. When Jesus comes again, it's gonna be a blessed time for the children of God. I want you to notice just three things tonight in the, in the text. The, the first thing I want you to just see is the promise of his coming. The word of God said in verse number 37, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. You say, Pastor, this was written almost 2,000 years ago. How in the world could it be accurate if it says a little while? Well, if you understand the Bible, if you go over to 2 Peter, we'll be over there a little bit later, not in this exact text, but the Bible said one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Beloved, his time frame don't work like our time frame does. And I believe even in Paul's day, the apostle Paul, when they threw him in jail, he wondered, will Jesus come before I get out of jail, go on to the next town? I believe they were looking for him and they were living for him day by day by day because they were thrilled about the promise of his coming. In John chapter 14, Jesus, let, let me just say this. If you believe he's coming, it'll take care of your heart troubles. I'm not talking about, beloved, a physical heart uh, problem that needs surgery or needs medication or something like that. I'm talking about, beloved, to keep you with your head above water and your chin up, keep you looking up, keep you encouraged if you believe Jesus is coming. Because, beloved, listen, Jesus told his disciples he's fixing to go away, but he said, don't let your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, our Lord Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I'm telling you, beloved, when he comes, I'll not be worried about whether there'll be groceries or not. I'll not be worried about, beloved, listen, my people and, and worried about the folks, beloved, and concerned about the folks whose health is failing and be concerned about the, this world that we live in. Beloved, the cares of this life will be laid aside and we'll go yonder to be with him. Think about that for just a moment. I was uh, talking to Brother Brian last week and, and, and he had mentioned something about having a bad day with his hip and I'm not going to go into all the details of the conversation but it came out in our conversation texting back and forth he said I dreamed last night that I was walking I said brother I said brother Brian I sent him a text back said something like this I said brother Brian it ain't going to be long he that shall come will come I said I'm going to be standing on the corner of Glory Avenue and Hallelujah Boulevard and I said I'm going to be like old brother Jack I said when you come leaping and walking and running down the street I'm going to say looky there you say preacher what are you talking about have you lost your mind no honey I'm telling you it's real he's coming amen he's coming he's coming he's coming and thank God I'm going to leave my sin and leave it all behind amen my mind brother brother, brother uh, uh, Jim talked about the fellow worked on the computer he, and brother Jim I believe you used these words said pastor he cleaned it up <laughs> Glory to God, there's going to be a day coming my computer's going to get cleaned up. 
Amen. I won't be able to go back there no more. Amen. In that mess back yonder. He said, Preacher, you ain't got no business dwelling back there. I don't dwell back there, but there's more back there than I want to think about. Say amen. Uh, yes, I'm forgiven. Uh, and yes, I can't keep a bird from flying over my head, but I can keep them from building nests in my hair. Say amen. Uh, but one day, it'll all be gone. It'll all be gone. It'll all be left behind. The song, sweet hour of prayer, this robe of flesh, I'll drop and rise to cease the everlasting prize. And I'm going to shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. Beloved, we're going to be with him. We're going to be like him. You can read over there in the book of Acts, chapter number one. I won't turn there, but those... Uh, Men in white apparel, they were there, and and uh, he, he said, they said, you men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? I like this. It said, this same Jesus, the same one whom you've seen go into heaven, shall so come again in like manner. I don't know about you tonight, but I believe that the Word of God said it. Jesus said it. Amen. The Holy Spirit in the book of Hebrews says it. The, the angels of God there and those white in white apparel in the book of Acts said it. And I believe, beloved, he's coming again. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3. Turn there with me for just a moment. There are those. Listen to me. Listen to me carefully. I'm about to say something I guess a lot of people wouldn't say. But there are those that are scoffing at his coming. Now listen to me. The scoffers might not all be the ones that you think they are. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Listen, I believe if we're not careful as believers, we can live like we don't believe he's coming. You can plant your roots and your stakes too deep down here in this world. Amen. And I believe God wants us to live, do like Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham was ready to move. He sought for a city whose builder and maker was God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Let me ask you something tonight. Listen, I'm talking to pastors well. You reckon one of the reasons we don't get as stirred as we ought to get stirred is because our minds aren't pure? Somebody help me tonight. You're not going to read anything in the newspaper that's going to help you with a pure mind. You're not going to watch anything on the television that's going to help you with a pure mind. I believe about everything this world's got to offer is designed to pollute our minds. Would somebody help me tonight? And I'm telling you, Peter said, I want to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Well, what is it that he's trying to stir them up about? He said that you might be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and the commandment of the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Beloved, I'll tell you tonight, I don't want to be caught in that crowd, do you? I want to be caught awake. I want to be caught watching. I want to be caught waiting. I want to be caught working for the Savior that loved me and gave himself for me. We see the promise of his coming. Think about this tonight. God was good to John, wasn't he? John took his stand for the Lord and they exiled him. They put him out on the Isle of Patmos. And I want you to think about this. Yeah, boy, this is good right here. God just spoke to my heart. What was the first thing? What was the first thing that God showed John? What in the church was it? What was the first thing that God showed John? He showed him the glorified Christ. You read it in chapter number one. You know, I think that's what our problem is. We get our eyes on the church and get our eyes off of Christ. We get to thinking about the tribulation and get our eyes off of Christ. We can even get to thinking about heaven and get our eyes off of Christ. I'm telling you, John saw Jesus. And then John saw the church called out. Amen. And John saw the tribulation hour come in. And John saw the marriage of the Lamb. And John saw the great white throne judgment. And John saw the holy city come down from God out of heaven. And when John got 
when he's seeing it all, he said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. The best thing that could happen is if Jesus would just come. I talked to a young man today that I love dearly. He got, got a, a young in and, and two more on the way. Talked to him about his salvation. He assured me that he was saved. And I said to him, I said, now listen, what I'm about to say to you, I said, I would say about my own children and my own grandchildren. And he looked at me. He could tell it was sobering, whatever was fixing to come out. This is what I told him. I said, it'd be better they never been born than to grow up and leave this world without Jesus. Folks, I'm telling you, that's a sobering thought. Them two little babies that run up here and give me a kiss on the cheek, it'd be better. they never been born as to grow up and leave this world without Jesus. I was just trying to emphasize the need to raise the youngins in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We can't make them get saved, but praise God, we can get them in an atmosphere where they can hear about somebody that loved them and they can hear about their sin and their sorriness and hear about a Savior that went to a cross and gave himself for him. John said the best thing that could, could happen, even so come, Lord Jesus. I see the promise of his coming in the text. I want to give you something here. I, I see something else in the text, and I, I hope that the Lord will help me to get this out tonight. Go back to Hebrews with me for just a moment, please. I'm going to jump over in chapter number 11 now, and then we'll be back in chapter number 10. Let me jump over here for just a minute. The Bible said, these all died in faith. My wife and I were uh, reminiscing about my dad's family, and we were trying to name them off. And I believe we got them named off, didn't we, Miss Eve? There's 13 youngins, 13. Youngins, and how many's left? Miss Eve, four, and they're all girls, ain't they? There's, there's four girls left. Two of them are twins. And um, the Word of God said here, these all died in faith. When Miss Eve and I were talking, I wonder about. Do you ever wonder about your family? Did they all die in faith? Did they all? Trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. See, we're not, I'm not judging them, but I am telling you this. There were some lives that did not reflect a life of faith. Do you hear what I said? Beloved, listen, if you don't have faith in Christ, it don't matter what the preacher says when you die. It ain't going to help you. It ain't going to matter what the friends say when they walk by the casket. It ain't going to help you. It ain't even going to matter what your spouse says if you don't know Jesus in the free pardon of sin. The Bible said here, these all died in faith not having received the promises. Brother Steve, what I want to talk about is the preparation for his coming. They died in faith. I believe people that really believe that Jesus is coming will make preparation for his coming. And a lot of folks, they act like, beloved, that preparation is getting saved. No, getting saved, beloved, is just beginning to prepare for his coming. There's a lot more to it than just getting saved. Getting saved will get you into heaven. And Paul even said it in one place, so as by fire. That's how a lot of people are going to die. There's no reward whatsoever. They just got saved by the grace of God. And yet did not, beloved, take up their cross and follow Jesus. Hebrews 11 says here in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Let me ask you something. If these folks right here saw them afar off, you think we're seeing them pretty near? You think things are shaping up, Brother Rose, for the coming of our Lord and our Savior? Beloved, I'm telling you, a one world order, we're right on the brink of it. Amen. A one world government, a one world currency. You say, Pastor, you've lost your mind, honey. They're getting their ducks in a row. 
what we ought to do instead of being sad about that is be glad about it. The king is coming. Prepare. Prepare for his coming. Having seen them afar, were persuaded of them and embraced them. And they confessed. What did they say? That they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Are you a stranger on the earth? I believe the closer that we get to the coming of the Lord, Brother John, I believe the stranger it ought to feel for God's people down here in this world. I believe we ought to know, beloved, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We have a purpose while we're here. But thank God, our ultimate purpose. Jesus even prayed it in John 17. He said, Father, I will that they be with me where I am. And it ain't going to be long, and that's going to be so. We'll be with him. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country. How many believes, listen, America's a wonderful place to live. How many believes heaven's a better country? <laughs> Amen. That's our home. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Preparation for his coming. Let me back up now in chapter number 10 and show you where this thought come from in my mind, in my heart as I was praying and asking God about tonight. It's bad, but it's fixing to get a whole lot better for the children of God. The first thing I saw here was conflict. Look in verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. I didn't think about this till I got home. Sunday, I said it's bad, but it could be a lot worse. Brother Steve, they haven't boiled any of our people in oil. Brother Rick, they haven't tied anybody a good shepherd up to a stake and Listen to them scream as they held their Bible and burned to death. That's what people, beloved, listen, down through history have done, been hung upside down on the cross because they wouldn't deny this precious old book. They said it'd be better to go to heaven taking a stand than to compromise and stay in this world. God, give us some men like that again. There's conflict, conflict without Verse 32 and verse 33, partly while we were a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while, whilst you became companions of them that were so used. Look at that. God's people being used. I believe that's still going on today. God wants us to know there's going to be a conflict. I believe the heat's going to get turned up. The closer that we get to the coming of the Lord, I believe the heat is going to get turned up. I do not believe the church is going through the tribulation, but I do believe the church may go through a time of persecution. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Beloved, just think about the last administration in this country. We're just one president away from being the enemy of the state. Amen. The preparation, there's conflict. Not only is there conflict without, but there's conflict within. Turn back to the book of Philippians. Let me show you the conflict that was going on in the Apostle Paul's heart and in his life. In Philippians chapter number 1, in verse number 20, he said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. Paul is saying, if you lay the choice out in front of me, I don't know how to choose. 
There's a conflict going on in his bosom. I'm telling you something, beloved. You let God, let us walk over yonder for about five minutes uh, and then come back down here, there'd be a conflict too. Well, we ought to be already in that conflict just reading the Word of God and knowing there's a place where there's no more sin, a place where there's no more sorrow, a place where there's no more pain, a place where there's no more death, a place where there's no more devil, a place where there's no more flesh. There ought to be a conflict going on on the inside of us wanting to be yonder instead of down here. Wanting to be home. Paul said there's this conflict he said, watch this. He said, I'm in a strait betwixt the two. I'm in a strait. I'm being pulled. I can understand that. A pastor wants to be there for everybody. But I'm telling you, there's times when a pastor gets tired and he just as soon, what I say Sunday, fly away. Amen. Every child of God ought to go through that somewhere along the way. Just like to go home. Amen. Like to go home. I got to thinking about my dad the other day. What a blessing my father was to me. He went home in 2015. Mom went home in 2012. Precious memories that I have. But I'll tell you something right now. They're home. And I'm going home. There's a conflict as we prepare for his coming. There's something else that I saw in the text as we prepare for his coming that ought to be evident in every child of God's life. And that's compassion. Look what it said right here. I, I believe that Paul wrote this and, and he said, For ye had compassion of me in my bonds. Beloved, I'm telling you, listen, listen to me. Listen to me carefully. If it gets bad, we're going to have many more opportunities to show compassion. Brother Larry, that might not mean a lot to some people. You just take up a DVD or a CD. But there are people in this world that really appreciate it. They can't get out. And they appreciate the ministry of the church they appreciate somebody calling. What I'm trying to say is, beloved, if we really believe that Jesus is coming, one of the ways that shows is we love one another. I would hate to think, Brother Kenny, that I was on the outs with you when Jesus come. And if I am, it'll be your fault. I thought I'd throw that in free, amen. I'm just kidding, Brother Kenny. We've all got this stinking stuff called flesh. Amen. But I tell you, if we believe he's coming, we want to be right with one another, be loving one another. Amen. If we believe he's coming, compassion. He said, you had compassion of me and my bonds. You took joyfully. See, Brother Larry, you don't deliver them tapes with the mully grubs, do you, Brother. You take them joyfully, don't you, brother? Amen. A smile. He said, preacher, that ain't much. I'm going to tell you something right now. Listen to me carefully. The song said it, but it's the truth. You'd be surprised how much is little when God's in it. How little is much when God is in it. It may be little in the sight of man but it's much in the sight of God. As we prepare for his coming, not only is there conflict and not only is there compassion, but I believe there's confidence. Look at verse 35. I mentioned this a while ago. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. But let me ask you something. When Peter got the preaching, Brother Steve, over there in 2 Peter chapter 3, and by the way, the second epistles were always dealing with apostasy. Apostasy is not ignorance. Ignorance is you don't know something. Apostasy is you see the truth right in front of your eyes and you turn your back on the truth and walk away from it. Second Timothy, Second Peter, 
the, the, these books, Second Thessalonians, they deal with apostasy, turning your back on revealed truth. So when Peter said over there, and, and he's talking about the coming of the Lord in 2 Peter chapter number 3, he's saying there are those that are going to see the truth, hear the truth, and yet they're going to turn their back on the truth and go the other way. But God said, for you and I, not to lose our confidence. Let me ask you something. How many believes, now maybe I'm wrong about this. How many believes that the longer that we're saved, the easier it is to fall into a trap of just settling down? We can even, to a degree, lose some of our confidence. God don't want us to settle down. That's why Peter said, I'm going to stir you up by way of remembrance. Let me ask you a personal question. I mean, it's personal. When is the last time you thought Jesus may come today? I had something I, I wanted to read to you. I let my wife read it on the way over here. After church, where she had been taught about the second coming, a little girl was quizzing her mother. Mommy, do you believe Jesus will come back? Yes, honey. Today? Yes. In a few minutes? Yes, dear. Mommy, would you comb my hair? You say, preacher, what is that? I'll tell you what, that, that's an example of childlike faith. Mommy, if you believe Jesus is coming back, would you get my hair fixed up? I told Miss Eve, I said, that sounds like something Olivia would say. Amen. I want to be looking my best for Jesus when he comes. Well, let me ask you this. Don't you want to be doing your best for him when he comes? Amen. Confidence. Then the last thing in the message tonight there's the promise of his coming, the preparation for his coming. It's bad, but it's fixing to get a whole lot better. There's the patience as we wait for his coming. Let me give you three things real quickly about true patience. In verse 36, the Bible said, For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, if you really have patience in concerning the Lord's coming, you know what he'll find you doing? The will of God. There's nothing in the world more important for any born-again believer than the will of God for their life. You say, preacher, I don't know where I'd find the will of God. I do in the Word of God. God's will for your life will never be contrary to God's Word. And I'm telling you, if you're praying about something and you don't know, if you're praying about a job or praying about a car, I remember one time years ago, th this guy had a little S10 truck. And, and at the time, I didn't have no sense. I thought that's what I needed. It was a little S10 Chevrolet truck. It was clean. It was a good-looking little truck. And I thought, man, that'd be nice. This one had the big V6 in it. I owned one prior to that that had a 2.8 in it. They came out with a 4.3, Brother Ike, and somebody said that 4.3 is a 350 with two cylinders cut off. I said, well, that 2.8 must have been the two cylinders they cut off. It was weak. It would go in the snow. You say, preacher, why would it go so good in the snow? Because it didn't have enough power to spin a wheel. On a snowy road, it'd climb a tree. I told this guy down Church Hill, down at Eddie's Auto Sales, you can pay me for that plug, Brother Eddie. Amen. I told this guy, I said, I, said, I, I like that truck. And I said, I'll tell you what. I think it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. I said, I'm going to bring my wife by and we're going to drive it. After she gets out of school at 3 o'clock, she was teaching. And I, and I said, uh, I, said I, I believe we'll just take it. But I said, in the meantime, I said, if somebody comes in here and wants this truck, I said, you sell it to them. He said, What? I said, you heard me. If somebody comes in here and wants this truck, I said, you sell it to them. 
He said, okay. Came back at 3 o'clock. They wasn't no truck. He said, that thing's been sitting here for three weeks. I said, praise the Lord. He said, you beat all I've ever seen. Let me ask you something. Do you want something God don't want you to have? How many's done figured that out? It don't work too good. I'll talk to you sometime about a Ford Pinto. You're just about close to walking when you get in one of them, amen. You don't, you don't think God can answer prayer about a job, about a home, about a vehicle, about a career choice? You don't think God can answer prayer? And I'm telling you what, if you're praying and you've got your gear shift in neutral, you can't approach the Bible with your mind already made up. You're wasting your time. But if you'll put it in neutral and say, God, you know my heart. I want to do your will. He'll show you right there in that book what he wants you to do. I believe that. Folks, I tell you tonight, I'm not going to go into the whole story. Most of you heard it. That's the reason I'm standing here. Because right out there on a parking lot, about five minutes till midnight, I done sat there over an hour praying and agonizing with God and reading the Bible. That's the reason I'm standing here tonight. God in my heart knows I didn't want to. But what do you do when God shows you what he wants you to do? You better do it or you'll be sorry. True patience does the will of God. True patience in verse 38 is willing to wait on God. The Bible said now, verse 37, yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. True patience is willing to continue to walk with God. Look at verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says it like this. For we walk by faith and not by sight. The world says show me and I'll believe. God says believe me and I'll show you. That's different. Amen. We're supposed to walk by faith I believe listen listen to me carefully I believe our faith is going to be tested in a very real way in the days ahead amen God wants us to walk by faith you remember Enoch walked with God that's what I'd like to do brother Steve I don't believe it'll be long to you brother Steve We just walk with God, and the Bible said Enoch was, and he was not. Thank God there's coming a day for every born-again believer. They're going to say he was, and he was not. We're headed out. Amen. I want to say this tonight in closing, especially for the unsaved. It's bad, but for some, the believer it's fixing to get a whole lot better. It's bad, but for some, especially the unbeliever, it's fixing to get a whole lot worse. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Let me read this to you. Warren Wiersbe wrote a book, Meet Yourself in the Psalms. He tells about a frontier town where a horse bolted and ran away with a wagon carrying a little boy. Seeing the child in danger, a young man risked his life to catch the horse and stop the wagon. The child who was saved grew up to become a lawless man. And one day he stood before a judge to be sentenced for a serious crime. The prisoner recognized the judge as the man who, years before, had saved his life. So he pled for mercy on the basis of that experience. But the words from the bench silenced his plea. He said, young man, then I was your savior. Today, I am your judge. And I must sentence you to be hanged. One day Jesus Christ will say to the rebellious sinners, during that long day of grace, I was the savior. And I would have forgiven you, but today I am your judge. Depart from me into everlasting fire. You think about this. From what I've been able to discern, 
Most of the people that have died with this virus have died alone. Some of the nurses got the grand idea to take maybe a tablet back there and let them communicate with their family, say a few last words to their family, maybe wave at them as they left this world. But they died alone. I'm telling you, that's bad enough. But I'm telling you, there's a place called hell where people will be in outer darkness. I recall to my mind, I was up above Damascus, Virginia years ago. A bunch of fellas and girls had a campfire built up and it was roaring. And I'd stop to try to be a witness. And uh, one of the fellas said to me, he was going to be the big dog. There's always one of them in every party. Amen. He said, I want to go to hell, preacher. He said, that's where all my buddies are in hell. And I looked at him and I said this. I said, sir, you can convince me of that tonight. I said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to convince me that you're telling the truth. How's that? I said, I want you to hold your hand in that fire. And I said, when the first drop of flesh melts and falls off the bone, you can pull it out. And I said, after that happens, you can look at me one more time and say, I want to go to hell. And I said, I will believe you. He wasn't so big anymore, Brother Steve. He didn't do it. No man in his right mind would. No man in his right mind would leave this world without Jesus. Jesus paid it all. He's coming again. He's not coming as a little babe in a manger, but the lion of the tribe of Judah. Beloved, he's coming. I don't know about you tonight. I'm glad he is. There's going to be some peace like this world never seen. Tribulation for a while, but then Jesus is going to come in that second advent and set up his kingdom. For years I didn't understand this truth. The Bible teaches that he rules with a rod of iron. What that means is there's peace because He demands it. He commands it. And then Satan's loosed at the end of that thousand year reign. He goes throughout the world. You can read it right there in Revelation. How in the world, Brother Rick, could anybody live under that kingdom and not want to stay in that state? But they rebel again. Read it. It's right there in the book of Revelation. Beloved, I'm telling you, There's a wonderful place called heaven. That's where I'm headed. Not because I'm a preacher, not because I pray, not because I try to be a good daddy or husband or papa. I started to say wife. That would have messed up a husband to my wife. But I'm going to heaven because Jesus paid my sin debt at Calvary. And there come a day when he convicted me, showed me where I was headed, I still believe, folks, a lot of folks don't believe this, but I don't believe a person can be saved without conviction. I don't believe that the Spirit of God, Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father which sent me, draw him. The Spirit of God ain't working. And I do believe this. I believe if you look, there's usually underlying issues why the Spirit of God ain't working in somebody's life. You remember the rich young ruler? Jesus, the Bible said, beholding him, loved him. Jesus knew what his answer would be. Paul, when he talked to Agrippa, when he talked to Festus, they were right there at the door, but they turned and went the other way. I'm glad I know him tonight, aren't you? Thank you for coming tonight. Brother Steve, it's a whole lot easier to preach with a few people here. Amen. A whole lot easier. And I want to tell you, I love you tonight. And uh, just keep looking up. It's bad.
but uh, it's fixing to get a whole lot better for the children of God. Amen. Amen. I appreciate you. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your people. Thank you for your mercy, for your word. I pray we could leave here with this truth in our hearts and in our minds tonight. Jesus is coming. Lord, a little while back, Brother Ralph led the choir in the song, The King is Coming. The King is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. I pray, Lord, tonight that each one under the sound of our voice is ready, ready to meet you tonight. Our heads are bowed tonight. I'm just trying to be led of the Lord. Is there anyone in this congregation?